Hello everyone, and welcome back to Revit Snippets. Great tips you can learn in just a few minutes. Today's lesson will show you how to use Revit and Rhino inside to create this very interesting building. It's an aquatic center in Beijing, China, previously used for an Olympic Games. This is how it looks like in real life, from the above and also from below. As you can see, the form is just a simple box, but the way they treated the facade has produced this very dynamic, special effect. That's exactly what I have built here in Revit. You can see here from the exterior, we have a cube. I can try to disable this crop region so you can see it, the whole thing. Here it is. And if you make a section through this form, you will see all the internal structure along with the ETFE panels on the outside and also on the inside. I will show you today how to create this in Revit as quickly as possible, including the panels, the external frame, and the internal braces between the two layers of ETFE panels. By the way, if you are new to this channel, make sure to subscribe now because we do tutorials like this every single week. Okay, let's get started. I can go to the Excel view now. Essentially, you need to have three different kinds of elements. Firstly, the panels. If I look at one of them here, for example, it's an ETFE panel with a particular depth for the cushion, and that has to repeat for all of them here. If I hide this curtain panels category for a moment, the next thing we will create is the external frame to the structure. Essentially, this is the frame that divides our panels and it will act as the primary structure supporting this building. And then thirdly, if I look at this left elevation between the external frame and the internal layer of the same frame, we will have those braces. This makes sure the external frame is strong enough to support the panels and the entire building. If I hide this, for example, these are our braces, which looks like this in real life. Creating this whole system in Revit would be a big challenge because Revit likes regularity. If you've been seeing my other tutorials, you will see we can do a lot with Revit curtain panel families and pattern based divided surfaces. If I look at, for example, this facade here, we built this from this single four sided panel. And even though the opening size can vary, the panel itself will just repeat it across the entire system. Similarly, for this second one, where we remodeled the Eden project, you can see there, there's some interesting effect, but each panel is the same, which is a six-sided polygon with ETFE membrane coming between the frames. For this facade today, because each panel can have a different number of edges, for example, if we look at the real building, this panel here only has four edges, same as this one. But this one, which is bigger, it has six edges. And if we keep looking, this one here is different as well, only has three edges. There's another one here, which has only five edges. To create this system in Revit alone would be very tricky. And that's why today we will use another very powerful Revit plugin called Rhino Inside. If you haven't got it installed, simply go down to the video description. I have included there a link to another video of mine showing you step by step how to get this plugin into your Revit application. So once you have got it installed, simply go back to Revit, go to Add-ins, and then click on Rhino. It will open Rhino 7 and also add to your Revit ribbon an additional tab called Rhino Cirrus. Here it is. In here, let's click on Grass Shopper to begin our scripting process. Before I do that, however, let me just close this file down, just so we can start fresh. And now in here, let's make a new project. Go to 3D now, and now I'm ready to go to Rhinoceros and open Grass Shopper. If you are new to Grass Shopper, don't worry, because I will slow and explain as much as possible along the way. First step is you need to make sure it's comfortable to work with. So for me now, I will just dock Grass Shopper to one side and put Revit on the other side. Just like with Dynamo, whatever we create in here, you will see a preview image of elements right inside your Revit window. So just make sure you have both visible now. Next step, we can start constructing the box which is here, just a simple six-sided object. Let's create it in Crush Upper now. Similar to in Dynamo, 
In Grasshopper, you can start searching for a note to use from the canvas. If in Dynamo, it's a right click to open the menu for searching. In Grasshopper, it's a double click. And now I can search for box. The one to use is here, box from two points. There's a little yellow warning icon there because it has to get some input data to begin working. And the data, as you can see there, we need to have point A and point B. The node to use now is construct point. This one here. By default, it will create a point at 0, 0 because you can see there when you hover your mouse over the input, the last line in the tooltip is 0. Same for Y and same for Z. This point can serve as my point A. For defining point B, I can copy this one and paste it right below. We now need to give point B a different X and Y value. To supply a number to X and Y coordinates, I can simply just double click now and search for panel. This one here. The panel allows you to put in any value. And one people usually use is this, just double click and tap in a number. I will use 100,000 now for 100 meters and then click away. That is now a number I can use for X coordinates and Y coordinate. Next step, I need to define the height of this box using this Z coordinate here. Just like before, I can copy this panel down and supply it to Z with a value of maybe 20 meters. Now, when I connect point B to here, the box has been created for me. It's hard to see here because cropping is on. Let me uncrop this view first. There we go. Moving on, we need to populate this box with Voronoi cells. If you go back to the reference image now, one panel here is the result of one Voronoi cell. And to have this many panel, we need to have even more cells defined in this box. If you are unfamiliar with Voronoi cells, just quickly go to your browser and search for 3D Voronoid. Essentially, it's the mechanism for dividing a shape or a volume into smaller cells. If I use this image, for example, imagine that's one single surface. This division rule essentially put in here random points and then for each point, create a cell like this. In the use the Lord in computational and parametric design patterns, that's how it works in 2D. When you apply the same principle to a 3D volume like this one here, you will get back something like this. That's one single Voronoi cell with its core point in the middle. And together, when you have a lot of these cells, you will get something similar to this one here. If we then further down the line, trim those cells using the surfaces of this black cube, you will get this one back a 3D trimmed Voronoi pattern. And if you haven't seen it already, that looks exactly like the effect we're trying to recreate here. These images below this looks even more similar. That one there is essentially this one with color coding applied. So let's do the same here now in Revit. I can return to Revit now, open back Brush Shopper and start populating this volume with points. The node for that will be Populate 3D this one here. We can now connect the box to the region input. And I know it's a bit hard to see, but if you zoom in a bit closer, you can barely just make out some random black points within this volume. It's easier to see in Rhino. In Revit here, the preview quality isn't that good. So the points, they are not really visible. You can still check if they are actually generated by putting here another panel node and supply this output to here. This panel node is similar to Dynamo's watch node. It will just let you see whatever coming out from another node connected to it. In this case here, we can see we have generated 100 points from index zero to index 99. Anyway, we can do better than this because this number of points we can actually control. Let's put in here something similar to a Dynamo's integer slider. I can now double click again and search for 100, two dots, and then 600. This will essentially create a number slider with the mean of 100 and the max of 600. Press enter now, and that's the number slider I needed. We can now press Control G to group it. Right click on the group now, and just name this group point count. I can now connect this one here to there. Nothing changes because I was still having 100 points before. 
That's the same number now. But if I now increase this to maybe 300, you can see there more points are being generated on the fly for us. At 338, I can see the point list is stopping at index 337. That's perfect. Anyway, for testing, we just need to start slow. So let's go back down here to 100. There's still something missing though, because we have to supply into here a point that this node will use as an anchor. Otherwise, some of those points that it's generating may be slightly too close to the boundary of the box. So, I now want to give into this input port, the middle point of the bottom face of my box. To get that point now, I can search for Evaluate Box. This node there. The box is obviously this one. And the UVW parameter is simply the XYZ values in the space defined by this box. The default value for U and V are already 0 0.5. That's good enough. But for W, I don't want to have 0 0.5. I want to have 0. So let's double click here again. Type in here the quotation mark. And then the number 0. And then press enter. That will create a panel with the number 0 as its content. I can now give it to here now. And the point is now there, in the middle of my bottom face. Again, very hard to see here because it's rabbit, but we know it's there. I can now simply connect this point to this input of the populate 3D node. Nothing seems to have changed, but we made a big step there, because otherwise, later on, we run into big problems. For now, we can move on. The next thing to define now is the internal void, because if you remember, going back to the reference image, there are two layers we have to define, the outer and the internal layer. Behind the internal layer will be a big void where the building functions will actually happen. It's actually a swimming pool now, so you will see this inside the building there. Making this is easy because we are used to having voids cutting solids in Revit. We already have the solid here, which is the box. So now it's just a simple step to define a smaller box inside it and use that later as a void to cut the bigger box. For making the smaller box now, I will simply just scale the big one. So let's search for scale. This not there. The geometry to scale is this box, obviously. Actually, you know what? This is the wrong node. I actually use a similar one, which is scale and u. And u for non-uniformly. This one actually allows us to scale the geometry differently along different directions, x, y, and z. Geometry is still looking for the box. And for scale x and y, I can supply to here a number. If I want the smaller box to be 90% of the size of the bigger one, I can supply to here 0 0.9. Similar to the number range we created before, I can also make a second number range or slider object here. Just do 0 0.1 two dots and then 0 0.9 so now I have something going from 0 0.1 all the way to 0 0.9 let's now supply this to scale X and scale Y when we select the box now the new one that's exactly 90% the size of the original box however scaling was done from this point here and that's actually not what I need I need the scaling to happen around the center point of the bigger box. That point we actually have created already. It's right here. And each point in Grasshopper actually has a plane defined for it. It's just a plane with the origin where the point is and the XYZ axis coincidental to the global XYZ directions. That plane for this point is now here. I can just connect this plane to this plane input of the scale node. And straight away you can see there the two boxes are now centrally aligned. However, there's still something wrong. If I look at the front view now, the Z value is still the same between them. I can try to give Z scale also 0 0.9. And now it's smaller. Just what we need. We are now ready to cut the bigger box using the smaller one. The note for that will be solid difference. This one here. You can see BREPS A and BREPS B, and that can be a bit confusing. In Rhino's term, BREPS are simply the common term to call objects that has a volume and are not meshes. BREP A can be our big box here, and for BREP B, it will be the smaller box. That has worked, 
I can now see coming up from here is one closed B rep. If I now hide everything before it, simply select them like this, middle mouse click on the canvas, and choose to disable their preview. You can see they are a little more gray now. This one, however, is not affected. So when I click on this now, I can see that's the resulted geometry from the cut, ready to rock. We can now start populating it with 3D Voronoi cells. Let's search for Voronoi 3D. In this center points, which we can get and supply from here. And then the box will be the original box from the beginning, this one there. You can see now, we have back from this node, 100 closed cells. We can later on control the number of cells just by varying the number of points here. There's something more important to fix. As you can see in the preview, those 3D Voronoi cells, they go all around the big box, even into the void in the middle where our building function should be. To clear out the middle section, we need to do another cut of those cells. This time, I can use solid intersection. So, the first thing to cut will be those cells here. I can make them go into B reps A. And for B reps B, we can use our result from this solid difference. Supply it to there. And now these are proper cells contained within our defined volume. To see them clearly, I will turn off the preview of the original cells. So select, middle click, and disable preview. That's looking much more neat. And here we can say we are starting to get the same effect we are looking for. So here you have a five-sided cell. Here you have a four-sided one. This one has only three edges. That's perfect. Next step, we need to explode each of these cells to obtain faces for external ETFE panels and faces for internal ETFE panels. To explode them, we can search for BREP deconstruct, this one here. I can supply these to here now, and I will explode each cell into individual faces, edges, and vertices or points. Now, here's a plan. For each face, we will obtain the center point of that face. We will then move the center point away from the face by a small amount along the face normal direction. And then we can check if the new point is still inside the volume we have set out for the envelope of this building. If it's outside, then that face is an external or internal ETFE panel face. Otherwise, that face will be one of those connecting the two faces and we can separate them out. So let's get the center point first. In Crash Hopper, the quickest way to get those center points will be to get the area of those faces. So I can search for area now. Supply that list to the geometry input. And you can see now we have 721 area values along with 721 points or centroids. Next up, we can obtain the normal vector of those faces. The note for that will be evaluate surface. This one here. Our surfaces will be those and the points we need will be those centroids. Connect them like this, and you will see then normal vectors coming up from here. Next step, we need to move those points by a small amount. Let's move them using the move node. The geometry to move will be those center points there. And the motion will be those normal vectors. By doing this, I have now in here more than 700 points. Let's now check if some of them are inside our solid. The note for that will be point in BREP. This one here. The points will be obviously those coming out from geometry. And the BREP will be the solid we just created. Before we get that, however, as you can see in the preview, those points, they are shooting like crazy in multiple directions. And that's because those vector from here, from the normal output, they are not unitized. A unitized vector is a vector of the same direction as the original, but has the length reduced to only one or one unit. I can right click on this and choose unitize. You can still see some of them there, but that's only coming from here, from this node, as a preview. I can right click and turn off preview of it. Here we go, much cleaner now. 
we can now finally supply the BREP to this check. Let's go back to the beginning. That's the one we need there. We're going to supply it straight to here. The result will be similar to what you have as a mask in Dynamo. If I try to see it here using a panel, you can tell it's very identical. Just a list of true and false values. From this I can tell, for example, the first Voronoi cell, it has 11 faces, five of which are internal to the mass and the rest are external. That means I can later on turn those faces here into panels and use the internal ones to create structural braces or framing instead. To get there, I need to separate those faces into an external and an internal list. Similar to what you have in Dynamo as a filter by Boolean mask node, in Crushhopper, the equivalent is Dispatch. This one here. The Dispatch pattern will be the mask coming out from this node here. I can connect right there. And the list of items to be filtered will be those faces. If you want to check the output, simply turn off preview of everything here. I will turn off those as well. And here, just drop in here a quick geometry node. And connect maybe list A to this node there. As you can see, list A is for internal faces, and list B, you guessed it, is for all those external ones. There's a slight problem here. You can see some faces are wrongly categorized as external faces. But that's only because we are now working with a sample setup data, and that means we only have 100 Voronoi cells. When we later on increase the number of cells, these should go away. Now, before we turn those faces into panels, there's a small problem here to fix first. As you can see there, by doing this, we also get faces that are at the bottom of our solid. This one, ideally, we don't want to turn that into an ETFE panel, because that won't make any sense. So, let's try now to exclude those faces on the ground before we move on. To do so, we can compare the center point's Z value against the Z value of the bottom face of this solid. If the value is almost the same, we can then exclude those faces by filtering them out using another dispatch node like this one. So, one step at a time, let's go and put in here another area node to obtain the center point of those faces. These are now there. I cannot use a deconstruct point node and connect it to here, which will give me a list of Z values for those center points. We can now copy this node and then use it to obtain the Z value of the bottom face of this solid. We actually already have a point on that surface, which is coming from here. Let's now connect it to there. And that's the Z value of this point, zero in this case, obviously. Next step, we're going to connect those two groups of values using a greater than node. This one there. The first number to put in this check will be those Z values there. And the second number is this one, obviously. Just like before, this also gives us a list of trues and false values. If you want to be certain, we can see them now. Here they are. I can now use these as the mask for the next dispatch node. So the pattern can go into here now. And the list of faces is what I want to filter. Here we go. I can now see the result of list A. Just like before, let me turn off previews of things that are not relevant. So that's list A. As you can see there, it works quite well. But if I look at list B now, these are the faces I want to exclude. You can see it's actually missing one face there. And that's because this value is at zero. In Revit, there's always this rounding error that sometimes kicks in. Something that looks like a zero can actually be 0 0.0001 or even worse, minus a very small amount. To get around this rounding error, we need to increase this value slightly. I can put in here a, a plus node now for addition and increase that value now by 1. When I plug this into here, 
you will see now it's working properly. Just a little trick there for you. Anyway, it's not this B that we need. We want to go ahead now with list A. So all those panels above the ground. Here's the plan. I want to obtain from those faces their boundary lines, offset those lines inward to create the depth of the frame, make a lob surface between each panel's internal and external boundaries, and then thicken those surfaces into 3D frames for my panels. So, one step at a time now, let's put in here a curve node. This is what I really like about Crash Hopper. With Dynamo, you always have to explicitly convert between element types. With Crash Hopper, sometimes it just does it on its own. For example here, I have from this list 8 output, a list of services as you can see there. If I now connect those services into this curve node, it will immediately keep back polycurves from those services boundaries without me having to look for maybe a phase dot boundaries node like I would have to do in Dynamo. Next step, I would try to offset these curves inside using offset curve. Those actually go to there. And for the distance, this is where we control the depth of our frame. I will use here another slider. So maybe from 50 all the way to 300. And now the starting value, if I double click there, I can change to be 150. Connect this to distance. And if I zoom a bit in now, the offset has happened, but it's going in the wrong direction. If that's where my two panels meet, I want the offset to go inwards, not outwards. So instead of 150, I actually have to flip this value to the negative. That's easy to do here. I can right click on distance, go to expression now and set that to be minus X with X being whatever value I'm trying to pass into this input port. You can see as soon as that's done, I have my panel boundary curves ready for the next step. Or have I, if I look closely into here, that one is still offsetting in the wrong direction. To fix this, we need to define the plane on which the offset has to take place. And here another nice thing about Crash Hopper, instead of having to convert from curves to plane, I can just connect them directly into plane. And now that has fixed them for me, all those boundary lines. There's an error there, however, let's see what it says. This is happening because, again, of our small sample size of Voronoi cells. For example, those services here. You can see they didn't get offset properly. When we increase the number of cells later on, this problem should disappear. Actually, you know what? Let's try that now. If I go back to the beginning, let's change this to a bigger value, maybe 580. Immediately, that's a much more interesting building. And you can see there, as promised, we don't see those problematic faces anymore. But let's check again on the error down here. It has gone, so we're good to go. Next step, I can try to remove this high value, put it back to 100. Just so we can continue developing at a reasonable speed. So we know that's ignorable for now, even though I wonder if we put it just a little bit higher, like 150, would that be okay? Yeah, that's better now. It's good not to have something red on our face all the time. Moving on, I want to have another check here. I want to see if the new curve from the offset operation is actually closed. This is because for some very small panel. Let's see if I can find one here. Yeah, like this one here. If the offset is too big of a value, the resulted polycurve can be too small and it can start to clash with itself. To do this, I'll show you. If I change this value to something much bigger, like 300, or maybe let's increase the maximum value now to 1000, and then crank this one all the way up to 900. You can see, that's getting very funky now. We need to find a way to prevent this from breaking our script. Let's change it back to 150. The way to prevent that problem is to check for these curves if they are closed. In Crash Hopper, simply type in here closed. And that's the one to use. Put them into here. We'll get back a list of checking results, obviously. I can do another dispatch node. 
This is to exclude any new poly curves that are not closed. So it's essentially list A that I need. Because I've done that, however, I also have a second identical dispatch node here to filter out any original boundary curves that produce new curves that are not closed. So from this point onwards, I should only use list A from that and from this. Okay, I now have to combine the original curves from here with the offset curves from there into pairs so I can create lob services between each pair. Let's do a merge node here to merge the two data streams together. So data 1 will be there and it should be data 2. With this one, uh, it's always good to see the result before we continue. You can see there it's not doing what we need. We need sublist, each one with two items only. This one has too many. There's also another issue. If you look at this output here, it has 491 items. This one, however, only has 304. So this dispatch node isn't working as expected. And the reason is this. If I now see those original curves, you can see here, we have here four list levels. Let's now copy this panel and see what we have from the offsetted version of those curves. We now have, instead of four, we have a five levels list. To reduce the number of levels here, I can try to right click here and choose to simplify this list. That now has brought it back to only two levels. Let's see how many are coming up from here now. Still 491. That means I need to check the data structure from here and the data structure from our mask. Let's connect this to here now. As you can see, the mask here has one item per sublist, and each sublist only has one item only. This one has too many. To fix this, I need to graft this input list from this list of curves. Just double click now and choose graft. When I connect this to here and see the output, that's much more similar to my mask. I can now connect the crafted version to this input there. And finally, that gives me 304 items, the same number I have from here. Now I know it's working. Anyway, something is still wrong because from this merge data node, I still haven't got two curves per sublist. Also, the list levels are not matching. This item here, for example, is only two levels deep. But this one is now five levels deep. I can see that crazy number of levels is coming from this one, list A from the first dispatch node. What I can do here to fix this is right clicking here and choosing simplify. And there you have them. Now we have one curve from the original list and one curve from the offset list paired together, ready to be turned into loft surfaces. I can now search for loft and use this one here now to create surfaces straight away. You can see that highlighted in here already in green. If I want to make it clearer, I can turn off preview of everything else, including that one there. And there you have them. These are our surfaces. Moving on, we can extrude those surfaces to create our frame in 3D. So let's go for extrude. This one here. And then connect those surfaces to here as the base. It's not running yet because the direction input is still missing. What it needs there is a normal vector for each surface, which we can easily obtain from here. Remember, those are polyline pairs. Each curve from here, we have a plane on which it is drawn. And that plane has a normal vector we can use. Anyway, from each pair, we only need one normal vector. So I will just get the first item from each sublist using list item. Bring it a bit down here. If I connect this to here now, comparing to the original list, you will see now each sublist only has one item. I can now get the plane from which these polyline curves are drawn using the construct plane. 
In theory, we need to convert these curves first into planes, but because Grasshopper is so efficient, you can just supply this data directly to here. And that has worked. If I now look at the z-axis, I will see the normal vectors for those planes. However, these vectors, they have a length of one unit, and in rough its term, that's only one millimeter. We need the extrusion to be a bit thicker, so this is where we should amplify these normal vectors by a small amount. Let's search for amplified, or actually amplitude. It needs vectors into this port there, that's easy. For the amplitude, we need to have a number coming into here. I will just do another number slider. Maybe from 50 mil, two dots, to a maximum of maybe 200. And a starting value, we can use 100 for now. When I connect this value to here, we have the same amount of normal vectors, but now of a length of 100 mil. I can now supply these vectors to this direction input port. And you can see straight away in Revit, that's a frame having a proper thickness. Let's orbit a little so we can see clearer. There we go. Everything here is still transparent because these are just preview geometry from Grasshopper. We will soon convert them into Revit objects in a few minutes. For now, let's park this because so far that's only the frame. We need to actually now create the geometry for our ETRF panels. Let me clean this up a little. Select those and press Ctrl G to group them. Let's call this group Frames. I can also hide that preview, so we can now focus entirely on making our panels. Our starting point should be from here. If I just see what geometry coming out from this list A output port, these are the offset boundaries, the smaller ones, that we will now convert to actual 3D elements. There's a note for that, perfectly useful in Crush Upper now, and it's called Extrude to Point. Essentially, this will take either a surface or a curve along with a point and then it will extrude the latter to meet the former. Essentially something like this. So for now we have our boundary curves similar to this rectangle here at the bottom. We now need to have this point on top at a certain distance from the curve to then use that node to extrude the curve to meet the point. And that will create a 3D panel object for us. To get the curve center point, We've done this before. Let's do area again and put these curves into here. You can just see those points in Revit, very small there. We now need to move them up before we can use this extrude to points node. Anyway, here's a tricky thing. For smaller panels, we don't want to move their centroids up too much because then it's going to look weird. On the other hand, for bigger panels, we really want to move this one up by a considerable amount, otherwise the panel that are big will look too flat. In other words, we need to have a formula to work out the movement amount of those central points, depending on the area of each polygon. To do so, we need to first work out the minimum and maximum areas of those curves. That's easy to do, just search for bounds, this one here. When I connect area to numbers, it will give me here a domain. This is however at the wrong level of information because we actually want a domain for the entire list of areas. To do that, I need to go here now and flatten this area list. You see now that's much better. That's the mean area of all of those panels and that's the maximum of them all. Next step, we need to convert these areas to a new range between the minimum and the maximum panel depth we want to have. It's similar to a remap range node in Dynamo. The equivalent here is remap number. This one here. The values to be mapped will be our area values here. Let's connect them to there. The source is the current domain those numbers are in at the moment. This one there. I can now connect that domain to be the source. 
and the target will be the new domain of numbers between the min and the max panel thickness we want to get. To create such a domain, we can do construct domain. And that's simply a way to construct a domain from a min and a max value. The min value, let's say we can use 300. That's the domain start. And the max value, how about 2 meters? That's how thick the biggest panel should be. Next step, we can use this domain now as a target domain of this remap operation. As you can see now, from the mapped output, I have anything from 300 to 2000 because these are the new min and max panel thickness that I want. We now need to get the normal vectors of those surfaces or curves. That's the same thing we have done up here. So I can just copy that node along with this number slider and paste them down here. Now, just like before, I can supply these curves directly to here as planes. And the z-vector from those planes will be the normal vectors I'm looking for. The amplitude in this case, however, coming from my mapped values, going straight to there. This number slider I can remove now. And let's see how many vectors do we have. Well, that looks alright. But I have a feeling that the data structure isn't the same. Remember, we want to extrude those curves using those vectors. That means the list of curves and the list of vectors should have the same structure. If I now copy this watch node or panel node and see how my curves are structured now, you will see we have one curve per sublist. However, here we have all the vectors in one single list and that won't do well for our next operation. This is probably because I chose to flatten these values. Instead of doing this, I should have just simplified them. So now you see, also have to unflatten the list. Now you see these two are the same structure. My domain is not working again. Now I have too many domains. To fix this, I need to flatten this input. And now that gives me one domain again. That's great. My mapped values, they are now in the same structure as the surfaces. That's great. Now let's see my vectors. Also the same structure. So we're good to go. We can now move those centroids up by the amount defined by those vectors. Let's choose move. And connect those points to here. Also, maintaining good habit. Let's see the data structure of that point list. Looking good as well. That means I can give those vectors directly to motion. And that has generated for me all of these points. Next step, you guessed it. We can use these points here as a point input for the extrusions. And for the base curve, it's a no-brainer. I can just get them straight from here. Amazing. Now I can see that's working. If you zoom out a bit, you will see that for each panel, we have now a prism created with a high point and a boundary. Doesn't look much like an ETFE membrane, but that will come in in just a minute. I can now convert this into meshes using a simple mesh node. Just like it says, it will create from any geometry the simplest mesh representation possible. So now that should give me all 300 meshes. The next thing to do is to smoothen these meshes to create our ETFE membranes. To do this, just go to the Weaverbird tab. By the way, this is a plugin for Grasshopper. That means Grasshopper doesn't have it by default. If you haven't got it installed, simply go to your web browser again and type in Weaverbird for Grasshopper. Download. Follow the first link there, will take you to the download page. Then you can download it, maybe this version there. It says working for Rhino 6, but I have tested it and it's also working for Rhino 7. Make sure you download the file and follow the installation instruction they have here. And then restart your Revit and Rhino inside. When you get back, you should have this Weaverbird tab ready to rock. The note we need from here is this. 
Catmoke Lock Subdivision. Just a method to smoothen our meshes. I can now supply this to here now. And straight away, you see our meshes now having some curvature. If I turn off the preview of everything before this, you will see a small problem, our meshes. They don't really follow the boundary that we originally had for them. This is because the smooth naked edges has been set by default to 1. To keep boundary edges, we now can right click, choose fixed, and that has taken care of that. You can see now just by shading in Revit, we do have some curvature now, but that's only on one side of the panel. We now, for each panel, has to mirror this membrane across the base plane of the panel to create the other half of the ETFE cushion. There's a note for that, and you guessed it, it's called mirror. The geometry is obviously our smoothened mesh there, and the plane of the mirror command we can also obtain directly from those base curves. Looking good now, each panel now has two membranes on the opposite sides. You can see them there. We can now merge them to make sure when we import geometry into Revit, both faces will be taken along with the right. So let's do merge now and connect the original smoothen mesh to data 1 and then the mirrored mesh to data 2. Later on, we can import this whole list into Revit for our ETFE panels. So the main frame is done, the panels are done. We can now finally look at constructing our braces. And for that, we need to go way back to the beginning of our script. Before going there, however, let me just group these notes because they all have to do with creating our panels. So right click there, say panels here. So by going back, I mean we have to go back to the point where we separated our Voronoi faces. So some can be external and some can be internal to the solid form of the building. The external ones we have used to create the mainframe and the panels. It's time now to use the internal ones and generate our braces. As you can still remember, these surfaces, they are still here. You can see them in green there. Let me just turn off everything else so it can be clearer to see them. Here they are. Let me bring them down here now. And over here, the plan is this. We need to explode each of these surfaces to obtain their boundary edges. And then we need to filter out edges that also belong to external panel faces and internal ones. We only want edges that go between the external and the internal. So one step at a time, let's explode these surfaces now. Before doing so, however, I need to turn services into boundary curves. So let's place in here a curve node. Connect this straight to here now. Remove those services. I don't want to see them anymore. And get these curves to the explode node. You can see now if I connect the output to here, each of these sublists was one closed boundary curve. And now each has been exploded to only lines. We actually don't need them in sublists anymore because from here now we just care about individual edges so I can actually flatten this list. Here they are. Next step to find out which line goes between the internal and the external faces of the form. I need to have a scaled down version of the form and check for intersection. Let me show you what that means. Let's open paint. So essentially I now have a form like this in section. I now want to have an offset version of it because once I have this, if one of those lines goes between the internal and the external faces, that line will intersect the scaled down to solid form. Whenever there's an intersection between the red and the orange, I know the orange line there should be turned later on into braces. So let's go ahead and offset the B-Rep or the solid. The note for that will be offset B-Rep. This is also not a default node coming with Grasshopper installations. I got it from installing another custom package called Parakeet. If you haven't got it, go back to your browser now and search for Parakeet for Grasshopper.
download it and then follow the instruction in the same post closer to the end of it to install the custom package restart Revit and run away inside and you'll get this extra tab here with lots of exciting tools to use including the offset b-rep we are using right now so the b-rep will be the solid form we had from here getting into there now the offset distance should be just a small value maybe 10 mil to the inside of the form getting it to here now and you can see that's the offset solid that we had it's now time to check for intersection however to simplify and speed up the process i wouldn't try to do a line to solid intersection here because that's more demanding and slower to run instead i would just get the middle point of each curve if that point is contained within the offset solid then i know that line should be included as one of my braces later on to get the midpoint of those lines here we can use evaluate curve connect segments to curve now the parameter similar to in dynamo if you want to get the midpoint it should be 0 0.5 And there you have those points. It's time now to check for point in BREP containment. So I can do point in BREP. The BREP or solid form in this case should be from here. And our points will be from there. Just like before, it will come back with a list of results, either true or false. I cannot do a dispatch node. To filter out only those that returns true i want to get curve so these segments should go into the list input and the dispatch button will be that one there if i now turn off the preview of everything here and only see as geometry what i have from list a you can see now these are lines between my internal and external faces of my form not many at the moment, but as we increase the number of Voronoi cells, you will see a lot of them very quickly. Once you've got those lines, it's super easy to convert them into tubular members. Just search for pipe, and this node will quickly convert any line or curve into a pipe. I can now get these curves to here now. And for the radius, let's do with 75 mil. You can always change this later on. If you want to cap the ends of that pipe, right click and choose flat. If I now zoom into one of them, I can see that's now an actual geometry object I can use. Okay, so we have now all the ingredients to create our building now from Crushhopper directly into Revit. Let's group the last section now as braces and clean things up a little the three groups now are ready to be imported into Revit or in crush upper terms to be baked into the program baking means importing the geometry into the program so next time you can have them there without having to run crush upper again if you have been using Rhino you know baking is a bit simpler than what I'm showing now but because we have to bring this into Revit, there is a specific set of nodes for that purpose under the Revit tab. This tab, however, you only see if you run Rushpa inside of Revit. If you do this from Rhino itself as a separate program, you won't see this tab. From here, the easiest way to bring these objects into Revit is by importing them as a direct shape set of objects. Under here, I can do probably add BREP direct shape. Actually, no. It's brother, maybe he add direct shape should be the right one. Third time go lucky, maybe this one. Yes, I know it's the one because with this one here, you can set the category of new objects and also their material. Let's now delete the ones there and I will use this one for all three. Let's now take a moment and define first the material in Revit just so they can look great as soon as I come in. 
We can start from the default material and make a duplicate, call it ETFE. With this new one, I can set the color to be slightly blue just to get close to this reference material in the photo. So, the color there, maybe this color blue. It's my favorite. Give it some reflectivity and of course some transparency as well. Under graphics, I can set the shading color to be the same, but dial down on the transparency. Press apply to save it. And then next step, we can make another material for the frame. Again, starting from default, duplicate it now call it frames with this one we don't need a color just white is enough and we want to have no transparency but still with some reflectivity actually you know what I forgot to duplicate the material asset so it has changed this ETFE one as well let's duplicate this and fix this, make it like before. Yeah, it's good to go. Okay, for the material, we need to look it up using a name. If you go to the material group, we can try query materials because that has a name input. I can now type in here ETFE and choose that as a name. From the output, you can see there, it has one Revit material collected for us already. I can now connect this to here as a material and then use that to bring in my panels. Let's do the same now for our frames. I will copy these three over to here now. But this time, instead of ETFE, we can do frames. That's one material ready. Let's now copy this one and use that for importing our braces. Before the big import task, let's also increase the number of photonoid cells. So, more like the reference project. So from 150, I can do 580. Now, you can see straight away, that's a lot more diagonal members between our faces. Looking great now. I can now turn on the rest of objects so we can see what we're dealing with. How about our panels? Let's see them. Here they are, looking great again. There's something you may have noticed. We don't have many diagonal braces for the roof. And that's only because we offset the solid by the same amount across all three axes. You can see there we scale by the same ratio for X, Y and Z to get a thicker roof and as a result more diagonal braces on the roof there we need to scale the z-axis by a smaller amount there's some calculation here to do and that's where we need expression node this is where you can write formula and has it calculated in seconds I can now zoom into here create an extra input and then double click here to edit the expression I will just use something I worked out before doing some simple calculation something like that by the way you have noticed that I have this lock icon there I did it by middle mouse click here and choose this to disable the solver temporarily because I found that sometimes Revit just keep refreshing when I do certain things in Grasshopper and that's some delay I don't want to have anyway now we have this expression ready I cannot supply this 20 meter value to the X, this ratio here to the Y, and this 100 meters value to the Z. This whole thing here I can supply to scale Z, and that should give me more objects here diagonally. When everything is done, I can with the mouse click again and choose to enable the solver. Oops, wrong value there. That should be a divide, not a minus. Alright, much better now. If I now just go here, 
and look at our diagonal members again. You will see now there's an even number of them now on the roof and that may be important to make sure the roof is strong enough. Now it looks like we are ready to give it an input. Let's bring in the main frame first. I will connect this extrusion to geometry. Here we go. There's an error there, but that's only because some individual frames within this collection are too small and could be imported. It wouldn't make sense to have them anyway, so this is safe for now to ignore. Next step, I can bring in our phrases, just like this. Very nice. Finally, we can import our panel here. Here we go. Let me hide all the grasshopper preview so we can see the rabbit thing only. I will also freeze the definition just in case it's try to run again. And there you have them. It's a bit hard in Revit because you know Revit doesn't have the concept of a smooth mesh. That's why you have these triangular edges on the surface of those panels. But in terms of documentation, that may be okay, because you will do the rendering and images, maybe in Rhino. If you don't want to see those mesh edges, you can just turn off the edges from here, and tick that box there. I can also go for realistic to get the best rendered appearance of the materials. And there it is. Looks really white to me. I'm not sure what's happening to those materials there. Maybe the color isn't strong enough. Or it may just be the material transparency. If I bring it a bit down. Yeah, must be that one. Anyway, you can see now it has more edges on the panel surface than what I had at the beginning. But we can change that easily. Let me just undo the imports. Go back to Crush Upper now. Remember here, we have the smoothening of the mesh. We actually have to increase the level now. At the moment it's 1. To make it more smooth, I can increase that to maybe 3. Connect to here now. Actually, I can use the frames because they didn't change, so let me redo the two steps there. Now I can disable importing any more frames and only go for importing the panels. Save this and we can enable the server again. There we go. If I now turn off the edges one more time. That's what you have in shaded mode. And if we make a section box here, we can see the internal structure as well. So maybe cut it right there and right here. I cannot really see the sandwich between the internal and the external faces. Of course, the material is a bit off, but that's easy to fix. Back to ETFE now. I need it to be of a stronger color and less transparency. Looking great. If you somehow didn't manage to follow this tutorial in full, just go down to the video description and you will find a link there to download this Grasshopper script. Just one thing to note, we didn't have time to cover all the errors that the script can throw. For example, here I know we said we can ignore these red errors, but ideally we want to prevent them from happening in the first place. But if I show you how to do all of that today, this video would be too long. So if you enjoy this lesson and want more like this coming every single week, including other grasshopper tricks on how to solve these problems, make sure to subscribe now because we do tutorials like this every single week. Also, I plan to do a few more Rano Inside tutorials for Revit soon because the power of using grasshopper for complex geometry modeling in Revit is huge. For now, practice creating this building. Comment any question you may have below and I'll see you in the next lesson.